That's, I, I should. I should. We're live, Carly. Hi, honey. Hi, Meg. Good Hi. to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Oh my gosh. Um, and I, you know what? I probably should have told you this before we went live. When we did Tuesday live, as I put in my my earrings, when we did Tuesday live, I completely got lost from the screen. Completely. I I blacked out. I went away. And about I had to call one of the other people. And they could hear me on the phone, couldn't see me. And then when I jumped back on, they didn't miss a beat. They did not nice. miss a beat without me. So I was not sorely missed. Hey, in case that happens, you just keep talking. Go for two All right. Minutes. Good Go to know. I know. I probably should have warned you that I was, you know, that I had a trap door in the stage. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So if I need to go solo, I'll, I'll, I can do yeah. that. <laughs> you know how. You know how. Oh my God. So speaking of speaking of hard work, really, let's let's talk about it, and let's talk about you know what what you've been up to during this, you know, really the shelter in place, mm -hmm. and of course that's no pun on what you've done your whole life, but you know, shelter in place, literally, and that's uh, you know I won't even bring up the. Um, you know, the Texas storms that you were involved in and all the other kind of rescue emergency work. So this is an emergency on a different scale, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes, it definitely is. It's um, been a huge adjustment for everybody. We've had to, you know, I work with Best Friends Animal Society and I'm based here in southern Utah at the sanctuary. And so I'm actually in my home right now. I'm working from home primarily. Um, that does not mean that our team, our teams are definitely on the ground. Um, at the sanctuary, taking care of the animals, um, but we've had to revisit our all of our operations in animal care. Um, but you know, it's it's been a really <clears throat> interesting um, adjustment and transition. But you know, we're really really trying to look at some of the positives from this, and we're finding some different processes that we've had to fine tune um, in in response to this pandemic that um, has really enlightened us like, okay, well maybe we're gonna keep some of these new processes or these new schedules for our staff. Um, so we're trying to really look at the positive sides of what we can take away and learn from and um, as we approach the potential reopening time. Can you tell us more about that? Like what, what do those processes look like, not only for the people that are working directly with the dogs, but for the dogs themselves? Yeah, so a lot of what um, we've been doing is our staff have shifted to working four 10 hour days instead okay. of five eight hour days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been really great for everyone for a lot of reasons, you know, that they're not as crunched on time during the day. Um, they can do more things with the animals throughout the day, more outings, more training, more socialization with, with their with their own dogs and their and other animals in their care. Um, it's been interesting though, because we have to, of course, practice social distancing. And so it's one person per building. Um, and as you know, as we're working through with animals with behavior challenges, it limits us in some ways, you know, and being able to work on stranger danger reactivity and things like that. So we've had to become even more creative. Um, but again, that's really pushes our limits in a healthy way, I think. So the four tens have been really successful. Good. in our operations good. for both the dogs mm -hmm. and our our staff mm -hmm. they have them mm -hmm. three days off to come back fully refreshed and they're even more eager to come back to work and and get the things done that they need to do oh that, that you know what uh, my son just went to that he's a uh, mechanic on the water he's a marine mechanic yeah. and uh, you know they just did that four tents and it's really making a massive difference so i think mm -hmm. some of these um social changes that have been put in place are going to be very good for us. But let's, again, we talked about, and, and we've got stranger danger, but now we've got people with masks on and we, and we don't know when that's going to stop. And I talked to you, I reached out to you a couple of weeks ago, I guess, and said immediately, I thought of you because of the primates with the facial recognition. Yeah. So tell us, tell us about that and possibly, you know, our dogs, um, uh, responding different to strangers now and is and is you know their their own family strangers when they put that mask on tell us more about that yeah so that's that's an it's an interesting kind of connection that that you recognized you know and in, in our primates abilities to non-human primates abilities to recognize facial expressions and differentiate between um person a and person b and they remember people over a a, a long 
uh, duration of time. Mm -hmm. So for the dogs, yeah, you know, it's, it's an adjustment. It's something different. <clears throat> and um, I think as long as we're all working towards continuing to make these positive experiences for the dogs and not having false expectations that they know and understand what's going on, we have to teach them um, how to perceive this. Uh, this difference, having the mask on our faces or seeing other people with masks on their faces. So really just pairing that with positive associations, using treats and using verbal praise, petting, whatever is rewarding and reinforcing for the dog. You know, it's just, it's another adjustment period for them. It's just, okay. but it's happening to all of them. <laughs> so how do you, how do you, how do you uh, treat train at a time like this? How do you use your treats? Do you literally, you know, what, what, what's the most positive thing to do there? And, um, you know, and again, I always tell people, please don't lean over your dog. Don't lean yeah. in. Don't lean over. That's a huge, you know, that's my space. You know, you got, right. you know, don't, don't do it. So what, post trauma or not, it doesn't right. matter, right? That it's mm -hmm. the canine behavior that's pretty universal. So how yeah. can we uh, reinforce this positive thing about masks and gloves? What do you yeah. Think? So I think the first thing is, is, as you were just stating, kind of really understanding canine body language. And there's so many resources out there online through Best Friends and so many other great sites um, to really learn about what the different postures and facial expressions your dogs are giving. So understanding their body language is critical to you knowing whether they're comfortable or nervous or maybe experiencing some kind of stress. And so if you're recognizing some of these stress behaviors, then again, we use a lot of the look at that or lat work and, and training and teaching dogs how to respond appropriately under such stressful conditions when they have a triggering stimulus that is stressing them out or could be super interesting and exciting for them. It could be one or the other and we can see similar um, outward behavior sometimes. <clears throat> but either way, they're not mm -hmm. really paying attention to us. And right. And so we yeah, want to mm -hmm. teach them to, you know, look at that trigger, look back to us. We're here to help you get through the situation, reward them with that treat. So they look, say their name, click whatever marker you want to use um, when they are engaging with that stimulus at a distance where they're not actually reacting, but they yeah. see it and they're aware. Yeah. And it's clear yeah. to you that they are aware of that trigger. And then you immediately can, you can say their name, you can use a clicker and clicker training, click when they're looking. You can say yes when they look. Some kind of marker to indicate, okay, you saw it, look back at me, and you're going to get a treat. And this is going to be over repetition, over time, right, just right, like us. Right. We learn yeah, by tell, associations. And 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 tell us about, about you know, because clicker, you know, I... I, I'm, I can't do it. And, and the other thing, I trained horses forever. So you right. click from a horse where they can't see you. That one blind spot yeah. is right where you're sitting and you click and you're, uh, I'm gone. So, right, um, right. But, but I had a verbal cue. I, I would mm -hmm. kiss, I would click, I would tisk. Exactly. Um, yeah. One tisk was ho, two tisks was back up. You know, I mean, right. I had, you know, so is that okay with canines? Absolutely. And every dog okay. isn't going to like the clicker either. Some dogs are going to be fearful of that. So it, it can okay. be, it, the reason we like it is because it's very distinct and yeah. different than you're, you're, he's not, they're not going to hear it at any other time, you know? Right. Um, right. But absolutely, you have to know your dog. Every dog is an individual and, and what works for them. And you have to experiment and figure that out. Okay. I like that. So what, you know, this was a question we were going to get to at the end, but I figured we ju already jumped into it. So I okay. love this. I asked, I asked Amanda Ree uh, two days ago of uh, Sama Dog well-being. And I asked her, I said, what's in your teacher's briefcase? So that's like, I, and I explained that day too. It was like when my economics professor walked into the classroom and he had a briefcase that was this thick. I went, oh no. <laughs> you know, right. What, what, Right. Oh, um, and then not only what's in your briefcase, but what do you want to see from other people? So in other words, kind of like your doctor bag, if you'll forgive me on that. But what do you, what information are you going to pull out of that? Not necessarily something physical, but what what's your first uh, two or three pieces of information that yeah. you want to show? Yeah. So again, you know, you want to, you want to figure out, learn, learn from your dog, learn from the animals you're working with. And I'm just going to focus on dogs for the purpose of this conversation. Sure. Most yeah, likely. Yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But 
again, what is reinforcing for them? What's reinforcing for one dog is not going to be re necessarily reinforcing for another dog. So figure out what kind of treats they like. What is high value? What's low value? Um, what are they most responsive to? Now, I have a combination of things in my briefcase. As you know, I, um, I do use a lot of the Blackwing Farm, farm products. Yay. Have, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's some actually right behind me, right there. <laughs> me too, me too. And I've got, I've got one right here. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. Um, you know, I think that's the, what is it, the, the witchy mare back there? Oh, I is love that witchy mare. Yeah. Oh, I love witchy mare, yeah. So, yeah, I like that. Yeah. I like yeah. the, um, the brave balm and things like yeah. that, things that are going to be mm -hmm. calming and soothing. Yeah. Um, but I also yeah. use Young Living Essential Oils, and I'll yep. do consent tests with the oils to see how the dogs are responding and what they like, what they don't like. I do the same thing with the Blackwing Farm products because yeah. they're designed, but every dog has their preferences, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. What <laughs> think it would be, I don't want to interrupt, but I do want to ask, when you were in Texas, we might as well go there because we were talking before we went live about crises. This is a different yeah. kind of crisis. This yeah. is a boring, it really is. It's a boring crisis right. that we're yeah. in now. And we've really had to adjust that way. You and I are used yeah. to the heightened, exactly. oh my God, the winds are coming, the floods are coming, you know, yeah. and, and we're dealing with that aftermath. So I know yeah. you use Blackwing Farms down there. Yeah. And I think it was a lot of maybe drama trauma. Drama trauma for sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. That's always yeah. around. Definitely. What did you see? Did you just see? I always tell people it takes the edge off first of yeah, all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Anecdotally, I definitely can can see some differences when when we're using things like drama trauma specifically. Um, okay. And it's it's really it's really nice that the dogs are engaging with it and it's safe, you know. So we can spray it yeah. on their blankets. We can spray it in the air. Right. As right. you know, I spray it on myself right, and, right. and work with yeah. the dogs. I have the yeah. hammock blend back there. I use it every yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and same with cats. We've yeah. got to give a shout out to yeah, cats definitely. because I've got so many cat followers. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like the essences. So drama trauma is an essence. The others exactly. that you were mentioning have oils in them. No right. oils for cats. I, I right. You know, that's just our philosophy. So mm -hmm. And I've not found anybody that says, you know, it does not result in renal failure or something else down the line. And I'm, you and I are so into it. And I also think that sometimes, sometimes uh, people are overusing oils with canines. Those old yeah. factory systems are so Yeah, good. you have to really pay attention to that. And I mean, I literally have on my desk my yeah. bag of oils that has yeah. Blackwing Farm products in there as well. These are for yeah. me. But yeah. I have to be conscientious about how I'm using them, applying them for myself and my own yeah. stress relieving needs right. Right. and my own diffusing that I enjoy. You really right. need to make sure that dilution's correct and that, and pay, right. again, pay attention. I have discovered one oil that one of my personal dogs absolutely hates, and it's my one of my oh, favorites for my anxiety. Yes. Yes, I and, remember. Yeah. Yeah. Every time, you know, I, I realized I was like, oh my gosh, every time I put it on or I diffuse it, she gets as far away as possible. So you yeah. have to pay attention to that. Yeah. And I think, you know, what we don't take into account too is the amount of, you know, all of a sudden oils hit, what, 10, 15 years ago. And I mean, everything, everything. So we've got to watch. It's, it's in our cleaning supplies. It's yeah. in our shampoo. It's in our creams. So by the end of the day, these dogs and cats are reeling from it. It's like, you know, I can't. And again, a lot of times you and I use, you know, uh, when we can, how we can, you know, the best, the highest. Right. I Everything we do is, I, I don't like to use the M word, but everything we use is medicinal grade. Yeah. 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 And so we, you know, yeah, we have to, we have to do Definitely. that. We have to err on the side of caution. Yeah. So, Okay, so um, give me one more that's in your briefcase. What's oh, in your you got to have a variety of toys. Again, you know, okay. again, not right. every dog's going to respond to treats either. They might be more toy motivated. So have yeah. a variety of durable toys, depending on the size of dog you're working with. Um, but you know, I really like the the thick Kong type toys that have the squeaker in there. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of dogs really respond well to that, so that can be reinforcing for them as well. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm okay. And what about for the people? What, what knowledge do you pull out of that bag? What's your stand out? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, again, it's, I think, you know, I, I've, I feel like a broken record saying this over and over, but for the people, it's okay. Let's show you how to engage with your dog, how to, how to listen to your dog and read that body language and um, be able to interpret, okay, this is what I'm going to use when I really need a high value reinforcer when I'm training my dog. So, I mean, that's just... 
I think that's my main message for people from this situation. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, so um, you know, I had I I was taking notes. I was so excited to uh, to be able to talk to you today. So we've got um, tell us tell us a little bit. So you are at Best Friends. Correct. And you've been there for how long in Kanab, Utah? How long you been there? I've been here for uh, three and a half years now. Going, I'm mm -hmm. in my fourth year. Yeah, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's it's been a great journey. And um, yeah, so currently I'm the senior manager of behavioral rehabilitation and research. Okay. Whoa. Stop right there. <laughs> so it's a mouthful. Okay. Well, yeah. So is so is your PhD dissertation, but. <laughs> So, but, but explain, please, because, you know, we've got junior behaviorists out here. Absolutely. We, we all want to learn to read body language. We all want to rehabilitate. That's what we, that's what we do. We care so much that uh -huh. we want to, yeah. So tell us, tell us what you're doing there in that Center. Yeah. So what we've done, you know, we've always had a really innovative and, and, and creative behavior team here at the sanctuary. And we're just kind of revamping our dog behavior um, program. And so now uh, what I've been tasked to do is focus on really solving for and digging deeper into um, how what behavior modification techniques are most successful for specific challenging behaviors at varying degrees of of challenging. And so I have a program, a behavior program, initially starting out in Dogtown that we just started piloting um, mid-November. And so we have one building that we are focused on our work and we rotate dogs in from the Dogtown population. We have very um, comprehensive behavior modification plans for them, incorporating our care specialists. The key takeaway and the key goal of this program is of course to help our dogs at the sanctuary um, over, overcome their challenges or make significant improvements and be able to better develop their life skills and increase their adaptability. But we, I'm trying to create something that is not going to be a black and white handbook of this is what you do for every behavior. We know that's not that's not the case. Behavior is not black and white. It's a study of one individual. And, but there's a lot of takeaways that we can have. And so when we're trying to figure out how we can help shelters across the country with the more challenging behaviors that we're seeing that are common in shelters, such as more excessive jumpy mouthiness, uh, barrier reactivity, a very misunderstood behavior most of the time. Sometimes it's, it's serious. Uh, leash reactivity and redirecting on leash, especially walking through shelters in tight, in tight quarters, um, working with shy dogs. And so the really cool thing is that we have this behavior program that we've developed or re, re, restructured, I would say. It's not brand new. It's nothing truly just like mind blowing, you know, but yeah, what, we're, yeah. what we're getting to do is, um, is research, applied animal behavior research, which is why I got into animal welfare, because I love helping animals. I love working with them, but I really love understand, better understanding the underlying kind of cognitive mechanisms to a point and underlying stressors and behaviors that are contributing to what we're seeing. And so to validate that and put that into numerical form and really see, okay, is what we think working really working? We have so many anecdotal, so much anecdotal evidence, so many case studies and things like that, but I'm really getting down to the nitty gritty and breaking it down so we can see that the different levels and severity of the challenging behaviors, but again, more importantly, how to increase their adaptability and how to do so in a typical day-to-day -day environment, typical day-to-day -day work routine, and make it realistic for our animal shelter staff and volunteers across the country. Fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I heard from one man from the Humane Society of the United States. He said, in God we trust, everybody else bring data. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. I, I can so, deal with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so backing into this, you know, tell us about your, you know, your PhD because yeah. it's fascinating because it's it's all over the board, but it's what brought you here today to the work that you're doing today. So, tell us, tell us a little yeah. bit about that. So, my PhD is in cognitive science, which is um, actually understanding the human mind. So, it brings together six different fields of study. And um, 
but what's really cool about it to understand the human mind comes in evolutionary perspectives and how we can learn from animals that we work with today to inform us of those underlying cognitive processes that might be driving, that are driving behavior, behavior, but we can better understand by having different models. Of course, all non-invasively. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so while my PhD is in cognitive science, my focus was on animal behavior and cognition. And uh, my dissertation focused on chimpanzees. But during my studies, I wasn't just studying chimpanzees. I was studying a variety of species. I was working in, animal, in an animal shelter the entire time through my undergrad and graduate career. And so, you know, you're again, in our literature reviews and our breakdown of research projects and methodologies, it wasn't just chimpanzees, it was across the board. And so I was really able to develop um, an, an interesting culmination of knowledge, I feel like, because, you know, that I was still studying human psychology as well. And so people forget, I'm not just an animal behaviorist, I, I also understand human behavior <laughs> and the human yeah, mind. We forget, we forget we're animals. We forget right. that. We can put ourselves up on a different rung, right? Yeah. Um, not, not to interrupt at all, but uh, can you explain quickly uh, the difference between behavioral science and cognitive science? Is there, what is that difference? Is there one? Well, I mean, I, it, it, it's all connected, you know, like I okay. said, you know, like, yeah, like the, what does our, cognition our, mean? maybe that's what I need to ask. What does cognition mean? Yeah. What so is cognition, cognition really about um, how an animal or human is thinking, how the okay. brain is working. So okay. neuroscience comes into play of that. I'm uh, not okay. a neuroscientist, but I have no, studied like, some things. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but I know yeah. some things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So it's right. really coming down to uh, the differentiation, I think, between how the brain works and how our brain is processing information. That's cognition. And whereas behavioral science, we're, we're looking at the outward um, right. behavior that we're seeing and we can study. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it starts in the mind, but then, yeah. And then the emotions drive the behavior. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, I am, I am such a nerd that uh, I, I reread uh, Darwin last winter. Nice. Of course, I was, of course I was in Northern Michigan, so I had time, but um, so I reread Darwin and again, you know, it, it was just, and it was about mammalian behavior and I, I loved it. And I should probably put this in the next uh, newsletter again, but he took a photograph and photos were so huge back in the, what, yeah, 1870? Yeah. Was that the book? So. 1870? Yeah, I think you're right. So, and, and so the, the picture was one of the earliest photographs and it was so awesome. And it was a dog snarling, lifting his lip and a woman on the other side, like you and I are split screen right now. And the woman on the other side, she was lifting her lip. Right. And what it, said, what it said was, it was like, um, you know, notice which, to whom the animal is showing that exposed tooth to. That's the yes. one, that's the one they don't like. They don't like their smell, their look, whatever. Yep. But it was, we think we're so different, Carly, and we're just, <laughs> dang it, we're the same, right? There really are so, so many similarities. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that was part of my PhD studies was looking at lower order versus higher order cognition. And, you know, there's, there's still just a lot of overlap. There's still so much great research going on just about that. And, yeah. you know, that I'm so excited to be able to be back into the game of oh, research as it being part of my primary job. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, and I, again, and I go back to the physical and just because, you know, um, you know, we talk about higher and lower, but, you know, I, I think we, we've kind of lost touch with, you know, like when, when the hairs on the back of our necks go up yeah. and yeah. I, and Darwin taught me that it was the um, the small muscles at the uh, the follicle of the hair that are constricting that caused the hair to go up. That's amazing to me. Yeah. Now every time I get goosebumps or something right. like that or the hair, yeah. Or I see a dog and I think that's the coolest thing in the whole world. Yeah. You know, I always tell people I love a good growl. Give me a good Absolutely. growl. Absolutely, please growl. <laughs> Please tell yeah. me. Please communicate. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So speaking of which, let's wrap up with this. I want you to tell us about that. What yeah, is thank that? you. All right. So yeah, I want to give a shout out about a really cool uh, town hall that's happening today. 
um, Best Friends has been hosting a variety of different uh, COVID-19 town halls and bringing in other animal welfare leaders. So today's is about reopening a different and better tomorrow. And our very own McKenna will be moderating this with some other really great uh, animal welfare leaders from the from I, mainly the Southeast, it looks like, yeah, from Florida, Louisiana, and Georgia. So that is today. It's at um, 6 p.m. Eastern time. You can find this on our website, and I can send a is link that, to Is that you. how to do it? Is that how to do it? Find it on the website? This I is think so. Yeah, I'll anything. forward you oh. the email, and then there's an option to register for it. It's free. Okay. Uh, um, okay. Ask the professionals. Can, it's going to be really great. Okay, but they can, um, no matter what, it's bestfriends.org. Go I there think, and we'll I find think, info. I think so. We'll so we'll, I'll, we'll double back on this. All right. Okay, yeah. good. And then the other thing is, um, here's your contact information. Yes. And I wanted to be able to say that, that email is the best. You're in and out of the office. You rarely, I know you rarely sit down, even if you are working at home. You rarely sit down. So it's, uh, it's Carly, C-A-R-L-E-Y-F at bestfriends.org. So email, right? Yes, and email, yes, any questions? It's all any good? Any questions? Yeah, definitely. Oh. I'm, I'm here to help. I love it. I love it. I love yeah. it. Um, can we can we do part two? We didn't even get to half of our I questions. Know. <laughs> sure. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Keep we'll on. figure that one out. Okay. Any, any last words? Anything at all? Uh, no, just, uh, you know, thanks for everyone for listening and taking care of your pets and taking care of our pets and shelters. And the more you can learn, the, the, the more we can help them. So. Oh, wow. The more we learn, the more we can help them. Love it, honey. Love yeah. it. Take care.